and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. This week's guest is someone I've admired and known for many years. In our days as reporters for breakfast TV shows, we spent hours on film premiere red carpets together, waiting to interview celebrities and shared many laughs along the way. I'm talking about popular broadcaster Melanie Sykes, whose progress I've been following with particular interest recently. Melanie has founded her own magazine and is editor-in-chief of the Frank magazine. It features uplifting articles and inspiring ideas about how we can all live more sustainable lives, focuses on highlighting green pioneers, sustainable brands, health and well-being, and supporting and elevating women in business. Melanie, happy Friday to you. I gather Fridays have a whole new significance in your magazine life because it's your day off, isn't it? Yeah, well, I actually this year changed my whole way of being around work where I was forcing myself to sit at my desk and get into a nine to five situation. It just wasn't working for me. I actually had burnout and I suddenly thought, what am I doing? I'm 51. I've started a new career. Why am I killing myself over it? That's not what we're supposed to be doing. So now I go with the flow and I'm very, very proactive and have so much energy in the mornings. So I actually work in the mornings and don't really do much in the afternoon at all. That's really nice because it sounds like you're discovering some real quality of life doing it that way around. Yeah and I just wish I'd tapped into what it is I needed much sooner but I guess age and experience will do that for you. The start of the year has been quite difficult for me and I'd been throw myself through problems and work and just kept going and going and going without any thought for my well-being at all. And so in that happening, I've realized I can only do what my body will let me do when it's ready to do it. Because if you're going against the grain with things, you're less productive. And what's the point in that? So I've changed my dynamic massively. And your dynamic, I saw this morning actually on your socials, sounded lovely against the backdrop of Storm Eunice. You went off and did a bit of meditation this morning, didn't you? I've been meditating for, gosh, it was when I got back from India. So that was probably about four years ago. The times that I don't do it, I really notice I've lost focus or I'm struggling with things. In the past few weeks, I've been trying to do it twice a day and it does change how you feel. It changes how you see things and it can change the future in a way because it's a projection of how you feel is what you get back. So yes, I did a meditation this morning. I thought I need it and I did it and it was a really beautiful one. Yeah. I've really got to get into it because I've tried a little bit, but I'm one of those people that sits there and my mind's so active, probably like yours, that during it, I'm busy writing a shopping list or a things to do list, but I've got to persevere a bit more, haven't I? Well, they call it practice and it's not about completing something or achieving something. It's about being in the moment and human beings think that's what we do. I don't know how many thoughts we have a day. I can never remember. I've got terrible memory, but I know it's a lot, but we don't have to attach more thought onto each thought that we have. We can let it go. And it's just the letting go of the thoughts. I don't think I was doing any food shopping, but you know, you're in and out of the now, but it's a practice. You've got to be in it to win it. (laughs) You've got to be in it to win it. I'm going to try that. Now, I want to know about the magazine, Melanie, because right near the beginning when you were setting it up, I was reading your posts and it appeals massively to me and features the kind of articles I want to read and the people I'd like to hear more about. What inspired you in the first place? How did the Frank magazine come about? It started three years ago. It was a bi-monthly online magazine up until six months ago when I made it into a website and it was born from the desire to get out of the TV industry. I wasn't happy doing it. I realize now why. It felt uncomfortable to me. I'm not built to be on stage. It's not in my nature to be the center of attention. I love to communicate and I love to talk, but the whole showbiz side of it didn't suit me. And as you said in the introduction, you know, when I very first started in the business, Big Breakfast wasn't my first job, but it was first of many where I interviewed people. Interviewing people is the thing that excites me the most. I'm always interested in other people. And I also am interested in the arts. So anybody that creates, I 
I find them and their process fascinating. But even back then, Big Breakfast Days, I was 26 years old. I didn't really want to be on TV. I found the red carpet excruciating because do you remember you had to shout for people? Oh, I know. And it always felt really uncomfortable, didn't it? It's just so awful. It was so awful for me. And also having to remember all the films all the nominees, all the this, all, I mean, it was traumatic actually, but you know, I smiled through it and got through it and actually endured it. Really? I can't honestly say there was a point in that whole time where I was fully enjoying what I was doing. Do you know you hid it well because you've got such a vibrant, bubbly personality. You've got a beautiful smile. Thank you. You you always looked like you were having an absolute blast, which I guess that was part of our job, isn't it? Of course, it's part of our job. It's what I was paid to do. It's masking is what it's called in the autistic community. Is it? Yeah, it's called masking. So I've been diagnosed and I've been masking my whole life trying to fit in. I used to say, I'm like a chameleon. I can adapt to any situation. And I've always patted myself on the back for being able to be in any types of society or any hierarchies, if you like, because ultimately I don't believe in hierarchy. So I feel very much at home anywhere I go. But also it's realizing now it's been quite detrimental to keep morphing into things that are arduous and are quite painful to achieve. So I'd got to a point, I was 48 and I kept thinking, I don't want to be doing this TV lark anymore. What can I do? And I was talking to a friend and she just suggested I start a magazine. And I did. I mean, it was literally a suggestion that I ran with and I've kept running with. And now it's a website. I get to interview people and I get to elevate others and I get to help others and I get to inspire others. And that gives me a great deal of satisfaction. For the first time, I feel satisfied by the work that I do. And I think that's really important, isn't it? It's really important, but I also think it perhaps takes us years of growing and years of experience. Life's like a tapestry, isn't it? We go through highs, we go through lows. And I wonder now at a similar age, a little bit older than you, but it's now that I feel that warrior inside me that you talk a bit about with the magazine. And I think at this age, I feel like I can embrace all the highs and lows and career good things and all the different things that I've experienced. And I think if you come out the other side feeling strong and independent, that's That's really something to be celebrated, isn't it? But I've also got to be respectful of what's happened to me. So with my diagnosis, I'm now looking back at my life with a completely different lens. So I'm starting to understand why I was a little bit easily manipulated into doing certain things and that it wasn't necessarily my fault. And that's my personal life as well as my professional life, because I've always tried to keep them separate, no matter how much people have tried to enmesh the two. My private life has always been private and It's been a very difficult juggle on top of having autism that I didn't know I had. It's been unbelievable. Can't tell you how much of a warrior that has had to produce in me, but I am actually tired now. And I just look forward to the rest of my life where I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing in the way that I want to do it. And people might look back at what I've done and gone, wow, what amazing achievements. And they were when they were costing me a lot. Can you imagine when it's not costing me that much? This next half will be even more fulfilling. It will be even bigger and it will be even better because I won't be in pain doing it. And that is what I'm excited about. We talk about the autism diagnosis in a minute, which is extraordinary actually to have a diagnosis at 51. That's quite late, isn't it? To suddenly find out. But just finishing off on the past, I loved you on things like Des and Mel and stuff like that. Was all of that a struggle too? No, because it was so brilliant because on Des and Mel, we didn't have talk back. So talk back was always one of my big sensitivity problems. I found it very difficult to be communicating and hearing things and the juggle. Now, Des didn't use talk back. So the first time in my career up until that point, there was no point me getting feedback and if he wasn't getting it because we'd be on two different planes. So we would get the feedback and the countdowns and stuff from the floor. So for the first time and for that four year period, I was working in a zone that I was comfortable with. So no, I don't include that in that because my sensitivities were being dealt with. Just for those who don't know, talkback is when we're on live television or recorded television, we wear a little earpiece, don't we, in our ears so that we can hear the instructions from the gallery and from the director. And 
in some ways, I'm probably the opposite to you. I like that humdrum in my ear as yeah. almost like a comfort blanket. But I could see why you'd probably find that actually quite distracting. And now you've probably got to the bottom of why you didn't like it. It is one of my autistic traits. I'm very good one on one. I can do two people talking at the same time in a dinner party. But if there's more than two, if there's like six people at a table, I find it very hard to focus. And I tune into sometimes other tables and what they're saying. My my sensitivities are so strong that I can just hear t- too much of everything and it's hard for me to concentrate. I'm just starting to understand all of the physical sensitivities as well as everything else. So how did the diagnosis come about? I've been approached to try and do a documentary about the education system around autistic people and what it means and how it is and how it's set up and it's not particularly conducive to positive experiences for a lot of people on the spectrum. And then I had a meeting with Harry Thompson. He's a speaker about all these things and helps families and children access their education. And we had a meeting and he said to me that he thought that I might be ADHD. I haven't yet to be diagnosed for that. I'm on a waiting list for that, but that is definitely I'm ADHD. There's no two ways about that. And then maybe to test for autism as well. And I did the test. As soon as he suggested it to me, all of a sudden I start to process what that means. And it made sense. It made sense before I was diagnosed. It was like penny dropping. It still is. You know, I'm in therapy at the moment. I've been in and out of therapy my entire adult life, wondering what it is that's wrong with me. Maybe I'm an alcoholic or maybe I'm a manic depressive. I've tried to find what it is that's bothering me. And then all of a sudden you get a diagnosis and you think, oh, I was none of those things. I was drinking to quieten the sensitivities that I feel. So finally, for the first time in my life, I'm in therapy therapy, understanding who I am and it is working and it's making me process all sorts of stuff. So I'm a big believer in therapy, but being in therapy as an autistic woman, but not knowing I was autistic is kind of a bit crazy, isn't it? <laughs> I went to see an addiction therapist. I've been sober a year and I've had massive periods of sobriety in my life. The last one was when I was having my babies and getting married and all that lot. That was seven years of sobriety. In May this year, it'll be five years. And a year after being sober, I got myself an addiction specialist. I didn't want to find out how to continue to not drink. I wanted to find out what I do with all that gets revealed by not drinking because I want to explore what is happening now that I'm sober. So now I know I'm autistic. It's obvious why I don't need to pick up a drink because I'm not actually addicted to the alcohol. I needed it to suppress my anxieties and fears and sensitivities. So once I know what those sensitivities are about, which is my autism, there's no reason to drink. I need to process how I live my life going forward where I don't feel so raw all the time. You've talked about it a little bit recently in magazines and a little bit on television, but the word that you keep using is it's a relief. It's come as a relief yes. to you. Listening to you there makes me understand why it's a relief because it's unlocking things that perhaps you haven't been able to understand. Yeah, I mean, there's been so many happenings in my life. I've had quite a lot of trauma as well, actually. And it's been unprocessed because, you know, I'm a single parent, I had a career it's in the public eye. Well, I felt like I had to keep going and going and going and going and going, but it's been a detriment to me really because I've been injured, emotionally injured during those periods of time and I've not dealt with it. And my diagnosis, it's shone a light on it all. I needed the light. I needed the light to be able to see and also to forgive myself because I've beaten myself up about things that I've said and done and how I've behaved. And this diagnosis allows me to forgive myself because it wasn't my fault. Things haven't been my fault. I've just been in a world where I didn't know who I was and that I could ask for certain things and get out of certain situations. It's hard to express really. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I completely understand. And what makes me kind of a little bit sad is that when I drive to Richmond Park in the morning, over the last year or two, I've been listening to you and Alan Carr on the radio. And I look at you, Melanie, when I wrote to you and said, will you do the podcast? I look at you as this inspirational, funny, gorgeous, bright woman who I want to be like. And it makes me feel a bit sad that you've been suffering that in the background. But I'm a human being, Helen. So I know. 
But you've given us so much, Melanie. You give us so much. Do you know what, though? That job is a weird one because, of course, that's the best possible me. And all the things you described, I'm going to take that because I'm all of those things. I am funny. I am inspirational. I am all of those things. Those things have not changed. But I'm going to even be more so because I'm going to be happier. I am getting happier. I love working with Alan and I love doing radio. The pressure's off. I've always said I'd rather do radio over TV any day of the week. I've always said that. And I've not been faking who I am. I've been pulling my socks up in order to go and be that. And I'm like that in my private life. I'm even more in my private life because obviously, you know, you can't say half the things you want to say in broadcasting. (laughs) There's a lot of stuff we used to say to each other that we definitely couldn't say on here. I know. I'm so explicit about everything. I love talking about sex and relationships. I'm really interested in other people and what they're doing and what's happening. I don't think anything should be off topic or anything should be taboo because we're humans and we should celebrate all that is to be human and explore all different sides of people. People aren't just one side, you know, and it was really interesting because when I did I'm a Celebrity get me out of here, for example. I was thinking about it the other day. That was me for three weeks being an autistic woman in a jungle on telly. That's autism right there. I knew I wasn't going to die out there, so I wasn't really particularly scared. You know, I was quite practical about what I was doing. I miss the kids, but because I've been separated from the father for so long, there's been a couple of weeks at a time where I've not seen them anyway over a period of time. So I could almost just park that yearning for home. And I was able to just get on with it and enjoy it. So when I went in there, my agent said, I'm not worried about you because there are no sides to you that are to be revealed. Some people, as you know, they go in there and there's a side to them that nobody's ever seen, but I've always been this. I've not changed, have I? You've not changed at all. You really haven't. It's funny, I used to think it was quite late getting into the industry, but I suppose I was 27. My model agent was going, go for it, go for it. You know what? You're at an age where you should be thinking about doing something else. And it was sort of there and I did it. But I've always been authentic me. I've just had to perform a bit. And the performance and the editing of what I've wanted to say has been the struggle. But now it feels like you are in a fantastic place now to probably to look back and do a bit of unpicking and fathom out what went on in the past, but also concentrate on the now and on the future. And I'm sure that the magazine must really, really help with that. You've described the magazine journey as a journey and a half. Doing your own business like this and starting something from the bottom up is challenging. And I just wonder, how's that been? Have you really enjoyed it? What kind of challenges have you faced? I wouldn't say I'm a businesswoman, really. I just wouldn't describe myself as that. I'll get other people to sort of help me with that side of things. The joy of it for me is sourcing content. The business side of it doesn't really interest me. So I've got people in place to help me with that. For me, it's a creative endeavor. And what I found by doing the magazine as well is ultimately, I'd happily not be the editor in chief. I'd happily just be the picture editor because I love images. I love imagery. So I've realized I'm really good at that sort of thing. I've discovered a lot about myself and I've discovered a lot about my skills whilst doing this. When we were a bi-monthly magazine and we would do a 200 page magazine every two months, every single page would be my vision, image, font size, spacing. And I realized I could look at a double pager and know exactly how to change it to make it perfect. I didn't even know I had that capacity because I hadn't been in a role where that was revealed to me. And I suddenly realized, my God, I've got this really fantastic eye. And it's that exploration of self and being able to be creative and just I am a creative person. But the people you find as well, the people you feature are extraordinary. I'm fascinated with women. I've always been a woman's woman. On Instagram, I'll just see somebody that I think is amazing and DM them and say, do you want to talk to me about whatever? And at the moment, it's been fantastic because people are really up for it. We're not in a position financially where I can go out and interview people and record it and edit it and do all that because at the moment, everything's done via email because of what's happened in the world as well. But also financially, it's quite tricky to get the content in that way at the moment. But it seems to be working fine as it is. And my team is like me and two other people. So it's small, 
but it's worth it because it's a celebration and an education. These stories have got proper substance, haven't they? Yeah. I mean, we've both worked in worlds at different times of our careers where it's all been showbiz flim flam, if you like, and it's all great fun and there's a place for that in the world. But I like the substance. I like reading about new brands and green pioneers and people who are doing extraordinary things and also reading and stuff about the health and wellness space. I think over the years, none of us have been really very good at that kind of thing. And perhaps it's with age, perhaps it's getting a bit older. All of that kind of thing is really important to me now. Oh, gosh. I mean, without that, we're living on half a tank and then we create other issues when we do that. I'm finally really starting to understand things. I've been reading all these amazing spiritual books over the years and you hear the answers are within you and you think, yeah, what does that mean? And I suddenly realized when you sit with yourself, you know everything that you need to do. You know everything that you've got to change. Your body actually, it'll tell you the pains, where you need to focus. So throat sometimes is about communication. I've constantly got an achy throat because maybe I'm not saying what I want to say. We do have all the answers and I'm suddenly starting to realize how important that is because it's all very well going to the gym and it's all very well doing the things that you think are going to make you healthy, but it's about your state of mind, your state of mind you need to look at and work on. And that's why meditation is key. But I have to say as well, we live in a world where, as you know, in the media, it's so negative and the terminology that we're constantly bombarded with is fear mongering. And I won't have it on my publication because I don't want to scare people into getting healthy. I just want to, inspire, yeah, it's inspire. Really, isn't it? inspire and it's help like, motivate. Have a read of this. Do what you want with it. But here it is. Have a little look at that and see what you think. Not if you don't, you're going to die. It's insane how we have to be bombarded all the time with the fear mongering. It's giving people the tools as well. And I've been making small, little, achievable changes for a long time now. It's not getting overwhelmed. What sort of things? Well, with food and better food habits and juicing and just thinking about what I'm putting in my body. And, you know, I really am a big believer in that you kind of are what you eat. And it always amazes me that we fill our body with nonsense. And if we put the wrong petrol in the car, we wouldn't be surprised that it wouldn't work. And I'm not perfect in any stretch of the imagination. You know, I love my wine. I love coffee. I love chocolate and all the different things. But I've tried to be much more thoughtful yeah. about what my body needs and not tank it in the exercise classes find what makes me feel good I like to go for a spin once a week I think that's really good for my mind it's good for my soul it's good cardio but just find a bit of time to have a little bit of time for me yeah. I think changes like that drinking more water I might sound completely dull but I drink three liters a day now which was a real struggle for a long time yeah. but I feel so much better on it my skin feels better my body works better but it's making those changes not suddenly starting in January with right this is it this is the new me the fit me I'm going to eat properly I've had some very good people around me in my life that have inspired me we've just been doing it kind of gently and it's it's yeah good. I mean I've never been into new year's resolutions because I make changes all the time if I need to, if they come up and I realize it's something I need to deal with, I'll do it. And like you, I love chocolate. I love coffee and I drink as much water as I can. And, you know, and sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. But again, if I listen to my body as well, it'll tell me whether I'm ready to do a workout or it'll tell me if I, it's yoga I need really, or actually to just lie on the sofa. I mean, I've just discovered Seinfeld. Can you imagine? It's like 20 years <laughs> post broadcast and suddenly I'm like lying on the sofa watching them back to back and it's nutritious for me because I'm laughing and I'm relaxing and if that's what it takes man that's what I'm gonna do that makes me laugh because with my 12 year old we've been watching back to back SWAT oh I don't know SWAT it's like a cop drama that he's been watching with my husband and I was like what on earth are they watching <laughs> now I'm absolutely <laughs> addicted it's a bit like you know an American version of line of duty okay, or something right. but it makes me switch off and that's what I struggle I struggle to switch yeah. off I'm freelance like you yeah. and you know the temptation is you're always at the beck and call of emails or uh -huh. phone calls or whatever I can watch three episodes back to back now of that because it makes me unwind yeah you've got to do it You've got to do it. You've got to do it. Just before we came onto the podcast, we were talking about our families and family background. And you said that you've recorded interviews with all your family. God, that makes me realise, Melanie, that I've got to do that with mine. What made you do that? And how did you suddenly find the time to do it? Because it's one of those things I keep putting off. You said it right there. You put it off. I guess I just didn't put it off. It's as simple as that, really, isn't it? <laughs> 
to be honest. <laughs> but what made you do um, it? Did you do it for your no, kids? No, I did it for me. For I did it for me. I interviewed my grandparents. They're both dead now, but it was like, I can't even remember how many years ago it was. I, I was just up there for the weekend purely to interview everybody. I interviewed my mom, I interviewed my dad, and I interviewed my mom's mom and dad because they'd come over from India. They had a bit of a story to tell and it's my history. So I want my history on record. I haven't ever listened back to the tapes because when they died, I thought it would be too painful to do. Right now, I've got to work out how to get them off little tiny tapes onto something (laughs) else that's more modern. I don't even know what that is. But I just think that who we are is our history and we should know our history. It's in our DNA. It's our molecules. I actually went to India because I needed to go to where my mum was born. I needed to go and stand on that soil. I needed to feel that heat. I've heard all the stories my whole life and obviously then did the interviews and had no concept of what it felt like to be in India. And when I went, I swear it was like I was home. You know, people kept saying to me, brace yourself for the heat, brace yourself for the smells, brace yourself for the poverty, brace yourself for this. But I got there and it was like, all right. I didn't need to get ready for it. I was just in it. And it was the most amazing experience. I came back a very, very different person yet again, because we're always morphing, aren't we? I mean, I don't know how many shells that I've broken out of and how many skins that I have shared. It's what we do. Nobody stays the same. Hardly anybody stays the same. Those who want to make those changes, the ones that are interested in unearthing stuff about yourself will always grow. The more you know, the less fear there is. And it really was life changing for me it makes me just connected to myself when did you go Melian was that your first experience of India I've been previously I was there for about three days the year before I was working with a charity it was about all the people that needed cataracts operations out there so I'd gone out there to watch some cataracts operations but then I'd spoken to my friend Adam and I said can we go to India and we did planes trains automobiles all around Rajasthan some nice hotels some not so nice and just really went for it went to the Taj Mahal did the touristy bit but also just really reconnected with who I am and myself and it was the most amazing I think we were only there for two weeks but we really traveled around and then the people I mean the people are just beautiful and magical and the light and the energy and I'm from there (laughs) that's awesome you grew up in Manchester Manchester area yeah yeah so I guess you didn't get any sense of that growing up I just heard the stories and obviously I've been brought up on Indian food because my grandparents didn't cook anything but Indian food. So I've been eating Indian food since I was a baby. And so in terms of culturally, the food was there and the stories were there. But to go there was a whole nother level of interest and amazement and wonder. And I can't wait to go back, to be honest. When you're ready, it'll be amazing to listen to those tapes. I guess it doesn't really matter how far away that is. It's just lovely to know that you've got that somewhere. And for my boys as well, because their heritage is rich. Their heritage is obviously Indian, English, Italian. It's good to know what you are and where you're from and to be proud of that. Am I right in thinking, Melanie, that one of your boys is autistic? So you've lived with an autistic child and then that makes your diagnosis to me perhaps even seem more surprising that it's taken so long because you've been so aware of it through bringing your son Yeah, up. but it just manifests so differently in so many ways. But we have got so much in common in that we're both extremely sensitive. And since I've been diagnosed, and he's 17 now, I see him even now after all these years, I see him in a completely different way now because I actually understand him. Before I was trying to understand him and trying to do everything I could in my power as we do as parents to make them as comfortable and happy and as taken care of as possible. But now I completely understand them. And I've told him that I was diagnosed and he said to me, oh, that's very interesting. (laughs) He's been hanging out with me a lot more actually since my diagnosis. I don't know if it's because he thinks, yeah, she's one of me and it's cool now. (laughs) But you know, my eldest has traits as well, but he's undiagnosed and it's all just become, honestly, I can't tell you. I mean, 
just the realizations after realizations of what's going on, you know, and how it's been and how did I not know? But then the people that were looking at Valentino for me and helping me with Valentino, how were they not looking at me? But that's the thing. It's really (laughs) common. It's not seen in women because women mask. Because what happens is the diagnosis of autism is based on how men present. Oh, that's interesting. So women don't fit the bill of what men present as because in life, men are allowed to behave in all sorts of ways, aren't they? They're told, be yourself, be authentic, be this person. And women are told to don't say that, don't do that. So as an autistic person, you just learn to not be yourself. <laughs> Which is crazy. It's actually, totally isn't it? mad. So <laughs> so you end up masking all of the things. Like, you know, I've always had a potty mouth. For some reason I managed to hold it together when I'm doing broadcasting because otherwise my <laughs> career wouldn't have lasted 27 years. <laughs> There's an element of me that's got Tourette's. I actually do like to say things that are a bit risky. I, I like the squirm sometimes. And now I'm starting to understand what all that's about as well. And again, I'm just going to be that. Because that's me and it's okay, but it's all been wrapped up in, in something I didn't know I was, which was autistic. Honestly, it's mind blowing. And I've only known since November and we're only in the middle of February. I've got 51 years to process. It's ongoing. It could take the rest of my life to do, but what I want to do is share it and talk about it because there are so many women like me waiting to be diagnosed, don't even understand themselves or have just been diagnosed and are processing. And it's a vast number. Have people been in touch, Melanie? Oh my God, yeah. Have you had lots of letters or emails or Everything. whatever? DMs, it's blown up with women thanking me, but also wanting to talk to me about it. Obviously, my magazine is extremely important to me, but I also this year very much will be on, on a mission to help alleviate pain for women like me and women going through that process because I feel it makes sense of it all if I do that. Because I'm an empath. I've always been an empath and I've always wanted to help people. And now I think, oh, right. So this diagnosis might be the thing that that's what I was meant to do to help people with this. And it's not the autism that's the problem. The autism is a blooming, I love that I'm autistic. The elements that make me autistic are the things that I think are bloody great about myself. So it's just being allowed to demonstrate that all the time and being authentic all the time and not having to put myself in a box anymore that suits other people and giving people the strength to do that for themselves. That is my mission going forward. And can you do that mission through the magazine or will you do that independently of the magazine? I'll do that through probably something else. I'm going to be doing a tour this year. I'm in talks to do a tour. I will be speaking at autism events and there'll be other things that I've got to do because this isn't just a British issue. This is a global issue. And what's great is that I've got experience of broadcasting in order to be able to do it as well. So will the tour be like a one woman tour, Melanie? No, at the moment it's with a few other people, but then it doesn't mean that next year I can't develop something. But also me on stage on my own terrifies me. I always need to be interviewed. So I'm not a good public speaker and I'm not very good at just being the main draw. I'd have to be interviewed in order to get it all out of me and take questions from the floor because I'm so good at freewheeling, but speeches have never been my bag. Do you know if there's anything, I really mean this, if there's anything I can do to help, if you need that friendly journalist from the red carpet 27 years ago to help you bring your stories out. Oh my gosh. Honestly, give me a ring. I'd love to help you. Let's talk about it. Yeah, because I need that. I've been forcing myself to do things constantly that have felt really painful. Three years ago when I started the magazine, I said to myself, I never want to say hello and welcome to the show ever again on television because that (laughs) used to fill me with dread and I'll no longer do that. But what I will do is all the things that I've described to you. And I just need to get my strength back because as I said, this year was not a good start for me this year, but I'm rebuilding in a bigger and better way. 
I am sending you a massive hug. It Thank has you. been lovely to reconnect with you. And you. Over our Zoom. So we'll meet in person and have a have Yeah, a yeah I wanted to catch up with you all the other stuff. Yeah, it'd be really nice to do that. Honestly, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And I think your words will inspire many of the people listening to it. Oh, good. That's awesome. This year is going to be great for you, Melanie. I know it is. Thank you so much, Helen. It's great to see you. You've been listening to broadcaster and editor in chief of the Frank magazine, Melanie Sykes, who's been talking also about her recent diagnosis with autism and the relief that she's felt following that diagnosis. Melanie's always great fun and I hope you felt inspired by her chat as inspired as I have today. Download our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts or wherever you listen to yours. I'll be back next week with another great guest. Bye for now. 